Hi, I'm Stephanie Wallace, and this is Independence Radio. Today, we're talking with social worker and behavioral health expert, Rosemary Sullivan. Enjoy the conversation. What's the difference between behavioral health and mental illness? Well, mental illness is a disease state, and behavioral health uh, is used more nowadays because it's, it's it represents a combination of mental health issues, substance abuse issues, uh, psychosocial issues, environmental issues, all of the things that uh, comprise what makes up a person's experience in the world. And that could include mental illness, substance abuse, use issues, things like that. And how, do, how does someone's behavioral health impact, or can it impact, their physical health? It can have a, a, a tremendous impact on someone's physical health, um, how they cope with the illness, how they cope with the treatments that are recommended, with the treatment regimens that are recommended, medications, things like that. Um, and when you say behavioral health, I think of things like depression, anxiety, trauma, complex living situations. Um, and all of those things impact how a person copes with whatever they have, whatever they're presented with. For example, depression can have a very negative impact on how a person manages uh, medical issues and life issues. Um, typical symptoms of depression are uh, sadness and loss of interest in doing things, but it can be fatigue, it can be overeating, undereating, oversleeping, undersleeping. And the impact of that on how we function in life can be can be significant. If you're not rested, if you're not eating well, the likelihood that you're going to take your medications as the doctor, doctor recommended, keep your appointments as recommended, get yourself ready, or be willing for so, to allow someone else to help you get ready um, and to keep those appointments. Your ability to concentrate as the doctor or the your providers or your caregivers are trying to coordinate with you and coordinate your care with you, if you're unable to concentrate and even hear what the person is saying, um, you're, not, you're not likely to carry through. And so we see lots of negative impacts um, on hospitalizations, ER visits, um, and things like that. As a person with a disability, um, one of the things I find is that we, we it's, it's like, you know, you got to be gung-ho, you got to stay in there, you got to put on this happy face and, you know, go, and it, it doesn't always feel that way. You know, you don't always feel that way. And sometimes to protect the people around you, like I have a family, I have five children, I have four grandchildren, and sometimes to protect the people around me, I put on a happy face. I mean, sometimes this really gets you, you know, it really gets you down, it really, you don't give up. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, and, and I, I notice with myself how it, it, it uh, it's like I go through these waves, like with the doctor, you know, I get, I get to a point where I'm very, I'm a very good girl, I go to all my appointments, I take my medications, you know, blah, blah, blah. and then on that down curve, I'm like, really can't come today, you know, and... Sure. And everything, and my family's looking at me like, you know, what's wrong with you? What's going on? You know, and I don't want to alarm anybody, you know, but I'm really feeling like I don't care. So I'm wondering, with people with disabilities, are is there a, an increase in maybe depression and, and things like that? Do you see it more? In Absolutely. People? Absolutely. The prevalence of depression is significantly higher with people who have disabilities and other medical issues. Uh, absolutely. Higher rates of depression, higher rates of suicidality, suicidal ideation, and, if you will, successful suicide. Okay. What is a su- su- I've heard that uh, term before, suicidal ideation. What is that? Um, it can range from passive thoughts where someone can say, oh, I wish I was not here. Not even I wish I was dead, I just wish I wasn't here. Mm-hmm. You know, to I have a plan, I have the means, and 
I have the intention to carry out a plan. So it can, it, it's the full range of just having passing thoughts of, you know, wishing you weren't having to deal with all of this, wishing you could, for some people, say, be in heaven, be out of here, be someplace else, to actually having an actual plan. So, <clears throat> like, I've, I've experienced, you know, where it's just like, just let me die, leave me alone. Mm. Is that ideation? Is that suicidal ideation? It can be, yes. What? Well, I never had any intentions to, you know, do anything, you know, or anything like that. So why is that considered ideation? Well, it's it's worthy of exploration. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have these thoughts mm -hmm. after any any kind of situation. After someone dies in your life, someone a breakup, a, a, a new medical diagnosis, or a progression of some medical issue. A lot of people have thoughts like that. As a professional, as a social worker, I've always wanted to know how serious is that person? How serious are you? Are you just having a really rotten day? And for some people, it feels good to say that. Mm -hmm. It just feels like a release. And for other people, it's the beginning of a process where they're actually thinking, what could I do? Do I have the means to do something? Or how can I do this? Or, you know, they they start to develop the thought into an action or a plan and that's where we're concerned so it's worthy of, of asking those questions how do you recognize somebody who's going through something like that or I mean how do you reach them how do you recognize them how do you like with me I mean I really would have benefited from talking to somebody you know but I don't I didn't like I said, I didn't want to alarm anybody. I didn't want to. I didn't feel like I was going to hurt myself or anything like that. But I just felt like it was something I was going through. I knew it, I felt like I, I'll get over it soon enough, you know. But it was just really a down, you know, swerve that I really wasn't used to. Mm -hmm. So it was surprising to you as well. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's the tricky thing about depression. Um, one of the main symptoms is losing interest in the things you used to like. So if you're a person who used to like to talk to your family, your friends, or your whatever, your social circle, all of a sudden you withdraw, that's one of the symptoms of depression. And it, it, it complicates things because um, if you're busy doing something, you know, out of sight, out of mind, and that's where things could get a little dangerous. It sounds like you had enough insight to say, to think this soon will pass, or this will pass eventually, but for someone else it, it can be um, complicated. And so what I would say is that caregivers, family, can notice changes. If a person is typically social, or typically pleasant or easygoing and all of a sudden the person is more irritable, impatient or not likely or not interested in doing the things they like to do, not use, not wanting to eat the things they like to eat, things like that. Um, noticing changes and asking open-ended questions. A lot of the, I, I've um, run depression programs for like the last 18 years and it's, it's a subject I'm very passionate about and so much gets missed because we don't want to make people uncomfortable. Right. Um, you don't want to get into anybody's business. Right, you don't want to cross like a line, and yet if you don't, you miss the opportunity mm -hmm. to explore something. And there's still so much stigma about depression. There's still so many bad feelings that we all carry. I'm a social worker, and you know, there's social workers I know who are like, no, I'm fine, I'm, you know, I don't need to go. And you need to go sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and But that's something we have to battle and fight. Uh, this feeling that someone's going to criticize us or the feeling that you're going to burden somebody mm -hmm. with some more information and and that's a real challenge um, or, or or not really knowing what is the matter with you right and somebody you know so because people people want to condense it down so okay so what's the matter you know and right. you can't really verbalize right what the matter is right you know and it seems like um, maybe you're just making the problem bigger you, you know, like, you start talking, and you're talking about feeling bad, but you don't know what's making you feel bad. You don't know, and it becomes like, okay, so what do you want me? You, you know, right. it's almost like you're giving a, the person that you're talking to a problem. Right, you something know? to fix. Right. And so many people are fixers, because you want, you, want, you, want, you want to close the loop. Mm -hmm. You have this problem, this is what we should do. These are the few things we could do, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know yet, if you're just 
beginning to feel these feelings, I'm sure you want to avoid those feelings. Mm-hmm. Who wants to feel those feelings? So you're trying to cope, you're trying to cope, and then you realize this is, this is, this is heavier than I so, thought. So how does someone who is experiencing uh, these type of feelings, what, what, what do you recommend for them? How do, how do they reach out? How do they begin to get help? What I, I like to encourage all the people I've ever worked with is to say what's on their mind. Um, even if they think it's going to be a difficult conversation, to reassure them that people do want to hear, even though people are busy, providers mm-hmm. are busy, um, that it's really important for their own health, um, physical health, mental health, well-being, to say and to honor that feeling. It's a very serious, it's a very serious condition that could impact a lot of things um, and encourage people to fight that stigma of feeling bad or feeling criticized. And to, to, and it's a way of fighting for them. Hopefully, uh, hopefully um, people have trusted people in their life, their providers, um, some connection. Um, sometimes telling a stranger might be easier than telling someone you know because there's not the feeling of judgment or I don't rely on you you're not going to you know criticize me or feel like oh one more thing you know and and so that that is actually a really great source of support sometimes talking to a stranger Mm -hmm. Um, there's a toll free number people can call in New York City well where you can talk to a peer about how you're feeling and it used to be you know the suicide hotline and the services that the peers can provide or anything from I just need to talk to someone I just need to release these feelings and someone to really listen because in our fast culture people ask you how you doing and the expected answer is good good right right, 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 sure they're not really sitting going tell me really Mm -hmm. no tell me you know right and 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 so it's it's challenging in this fast-paced world for people to stop and just really listen you know Mm -hmm. just resuming and um and some, That's a really key thing, to stop and listen to what someone is going to tell you. Um, I, I'd like to provide um, that number, that, uh, you know, the number later on at the end of the uh, broadcast. But one of the things I was thinking about on, our, on my way here was, uh, it was that people in general, we just need to talk to people. You know, you need to talk to we are social other people. people. Yeah. You know, and so at what point do you call it mental illness. We just need to talk to people. Sometimes you have things on your mind, things in your life that are heavy, and you just need to talk to somebody. You mm-hmm. need to talk it through, you know. My one of my favorite place people to talk to is myself in the shower, you know, and I get a you get good answers that way. So much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you work through a lot. But what what is it that that makes us so judgmental when it comes to that? As if it's a weakness. We treat it as if it's a weakness. I I think we still are battling with stigma about this. Calling it mental illness Mm. puts it puts it even at a more intense level of stigma. It's normal for everyone to go through periods of sadness, periods of of transition where where something happens and life changes drastically, or even life changes slowly, and you look back and you think wow, last year was really different than this year, and and how do I move forward? And these are normal transitions in life. And then when there's something adverse that happens, and then you really have to shore up all your skills and try to figure out how to cope, it's a normal part of life. And I think think a lot of people try to cope by uh, diminishing that experience Mm -hmm. and intellectualizing and just trying to understand the facts and not being in touch with feelings and that's not something a lot of people are comfortable with you know if you say you're sad you know it's those words um throw people off and so when i have assessed we're supposed to be happy all the time right exactly that's yeah that's the propaganda yeah and meanwhile we're really complex individuals and sometimes out of the worst times come the biggest creativity Mm -hmm. the biggest shifts and and almost a renaissance in development of ourselves um in how to cope with life and and honoring that is is the way i see um assessing for depression or just simply having a conversation when i say assessing i think of as myself as a social worker and talking to someone and really trying to figure out 
Are they struggling? What could be done? What are they willing to do? Versus even having conversation between just regular people, the people in our lives, having space for that is challenging. And I think it's people, more and more people are talking about it. But I think it's, it's, it, that's also a shift in our culture mm -hmm. to be comfortable with feelings. Now, how do you tell the difference between mm -hmm. being depressed and being, you know, like sometimes you, 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 you down, you, you're blue, mm -hmm. you're, you know, whatever. What's the difference between being depressed and like where you might need medication, you know, type thing, and being not happy, you know, right. or, you, you know. Well, it's, it's a spectrum of experience. Uh, the diagnosis of depression is a persistent... There's persistent feeling of sadness, loss of interest in doing things, um, irritability, fatigue, appetite issues, sleep issues. It's a, it's a combination of issues um, that go into making a diagnosis of depression. It's very normal to feel sad, to feel frustrated, to feel irritable, to have not slept the night before and so you can't focus as well or you're not, not so pleasant feeling. Um, those are passing things that happen to everyone. And then when it happens on a more consistent basis, that's when you could see it as more of going through a period of depression. And um, there are adjustment periods where for several months one can expect to feel pretty down. Something has happened. Um, a new diagnosis, you lost someone, you separated from someone. Thing, disappointments in life uh, could make you feel down. I always think it's it's a little bit unnatural if something negative has happened and the person doesn't feel down. Mm -hmm. That makes me wonder almost even more. But um, so I, you know, you one has to expect that that that's going to happen. Um, and then you asked about medications. There are lots of ways to treat depression. So medications is one. Talk therapy is one. Um, is another way. And there are various kinds of talk therapy. There's also other things that people can do to help themselves to support those approaches to therapy, whether it's medication or talk therapy. Things like um, focusing on positive things, creating a plan to sleep better, to eat better, to to focus on the areas of life that, that um, alleviate the depressive symptoms versus contribute. If you know you have a conflict with someone and every time you talk with that person, it makes you feel that much worse, so making a plan to avoid that as much as possible as a way of taking care of yourself. Um, medications have known to be very effective in treating uh, depression, um, and it's a matter of finding the appropriate medication for that match the symptoms and match other issues and that you would go to a doctor or a prescriber. A lot, a lot of people are afraid of medication. Mm -hmm. I, I can recall um, when I got my, I got a diagnosis, a skin, it's a skin cancer diagnosis and I, I was devastated because all I thought was cancer, chemo, death. You know, because my mom had you know, had had uh, leukemia, I saw her go through chemotherapy, and then she died. So that was just a natural progression to me. And um, I went around feeling like, okay, I'm about to die, and you know, whatever. And when I went to seek help, um, they talked to me about medication, and I had always felt like I, I don't want to take medication because I don't want to have to take a pill to feel normal. And, um, you know, the doctor, she's like, okay, you know, I can't force her to take medication, but she was a psychiatrist, so she couldn't see me unless the medication was involved, and blah, 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 and I really liked her, you know, so I agreed to give it a try, and it helped a lot, because it opened up the dark. The, the, the door and let that sliver of light in to where I could start to find my way out of the dark. So how how do, um, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with people who are afraid to take that step, you know, and maybe use medication? I typically like to explore what are the feelings around their thoughts about medications? What are they worried about? What does it mean to them 
if someone is on medications. And we try to explore those fears or judgments or whatever. They, the person may not even know. They just know they don't want to take it. You know, that's on the face of it. They mm-hmm. just, they're done. They don't want to hear about it even. And so I try to explore what, what is it about that? What does it mean to them? And you mentioned one of the things I've heard a lot. That means I have to take a pill the rest of my life and I don't want to depend on that. And then we explore, would they have a similar feeling if it was a diabetic medication or cardiac medication. When I hear that people are struggling with um, the suggestion of taking medications, I really try to explore what are the feelings around it. What are the fears? What are the judgments? What are they worried about? What are they worried family will think? Um, And that usually reveals um, what's really going on. And then you have room to explore, well, what are the options? How important it is is it to deal with this? How much are these negative feelings impacting your life and, and how you go through every single day? Because it typically affects your morning, noon, and night. And so um, in doing that, I feel like it helps people realize how important it is to take care of their mental health and to respect it and to respect their experience. Because um, that's what we have. That's what makes us unique. Now, something that been hearing more and more and more of is the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. How does bipolar disorder differ from depression? Well, if you break the name down, uh, depression is more focused on sadness, irritation, loss of uh, interest in doing things, where bipolar, the bi, means there are two sides to this uh, kind of depression. There's a side that is Uh, associated with the sadness, the hopelessness, the irritation, the sleep issues, the food issues. Um, And the other end of that spectrum are typically symptoms of mania or hypomania. Um, And they can be characterized by anything from simply talking very quickly, not sleeping very much, not sleeping for a couple of days, spending enormous amounts of money, even becoming psychotic um, and grandiose, thinking, you know, you're the leader of some sort of organization and you have 10,000 followers, just uh, examples of how severe it can get. Okay, and that 800, I don't know if it's 800 number, but the number that you were talking about. The toll-free number to... um, New York City Well is 888-692-9355. And it's a confidential hotline where you can speak to a peer. You can ask for a referral. You can, If you're having uh, escalated symptoms of depression and you're having thoughts of self-harm, you can speak to someone in, cri- in a crisis um, like that. So that's a 24-hour hotline that... that you have a, everyone has access to. And it's called New York City Well. Mm-hmm. And could you say the number one more time for us, please? Sure. It is 888-692-9355. Thank you, Rosemary. You're welcome. That was social worker Rosemary Salopek. I'm your host, Stephanie Wallace. I hope you found that conversation as stimulating and informative as I did.